right, well, let's all gather in. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here to join us. And a special welcome to our folks that are tuning in online right now, which we're calling Grace at Home. So all of you Grace at Home folks, we're so glad that you're joining us. And those of us that are able to join in person, uh, we're so glad to be able to gather as well. Again, we're just glad to be together, whether you're at home, whether you're in person. We believe that God's going to meet us right where we're at yeah, because He's just so good like that. So let's pray, and then we're going to enter into worship. Lord, we thank You for what You want to do in our hearts today, what You want to do right now, Lord. So God, we just open up. We invite Your presence here. We ask God that You would come and encounter us right where we're at. And Lord, we seek after You. We open up to You, and we invite Your presence to come and do something we could never do on our own. Connect us wherever we're at, whether in person or online. Lord, we know you can do that, and we know, God, this is the church at Grace Community, whether we're in a building or we're in our homes. Lord, we're still the church. So, Lord, we want to worship you as the church right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship. encourage you just to, in this time, just, I just feel that, you know, worship is supposed to be active. So, Lord, we want to worship you actively. And uh, if you're watching online, I encourage you just to stand up and, and to clap. And it might feel weird, but we're going to worship the Lord. We know that he's in the room, whether we're at home or whether we're here in the sanctuary. So let's just worship him. Follow Jesus. 
no turning back no turning back go none shall with me still I will follow go none go with me I still will follow go none go turning back in death in life I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my death is pain there's nothing that take a moment and just start to thank God for his goodness and whatever starts to come to mind just begin to sing that out to the Lord thanking him for all these things he's done
I love your voice. Oh, you have led me through the fire, darkest night. You are close like no other. Yes, Lord, I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. It's running after, it's running after me. Come on. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I'm hindered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Your goodness is running after, running after me. My life laid down, surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. And all my life, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. I just want to sing that refrain one more time. See, and I think about it this way, you know, we can look at our lives and we can see the hurts and pains that have happened in our lives. And we can sometimes look at those things and we can ask this question, God, where were you? Where were you? And I'll tell you something, that question is a good question. But it's not a question that we ask because he wasn't doing something. It's a question we ask because sometimes we couldn't see it. And when you've lived life long enough, you can look back and you start to see his hand. And sometimes we're in the middle of it and we can't see it. We can't see what God's doing. Maybe there's pain. Maybe there's brokenness. And we live in a broken world, so those things happen. But... What we're doing here is we're declaring that He is good, that He is working right in the midst of whatever circumstance we might be in. So I want to just sing this one more time. But let's just declare right now in whatever circumstance you might be in or people you care about might be in, we're declaring that, God, you are at work, Lord, that you are doing something, that all of our lives you have been faithful, and we will look to your goodness. So let's just sing that one more time and just declare it over our lives and maybe over lives we know that might be hurting right now. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. And every breath that I am of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing the 
good Lord, we sing of your goodness. Even if we can't see it, we know you're working. Lord, your word's really clear that you're working in all things. You don't cause those things. That's sin and brokenness, but you're working in all things. You're going to work. You're going to turn things that the enemy meant for evil. You're going to turn them for good. And so, Lord, we just lean upon you. We trust you in whatever circumstances we're we're facing. Lord, as our nation faces very interesting circumstances, Lord, we trust in you, in your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, you can be seated. Thanks, worship team. Man, I'll tell you what, just I love Grace Community because it's just full of a bunch of faithful folks who are using their gifts and stepping out. And uh, this has been a very interesting season, as many of you know, as we've been uh, doing our Saturday night service and Sunday morning, and a bunch of people are meeting in their homes. And so I know some people have felt disconnected, but I want to tell you something, and because I get to just sort of touch everybody and, you know, talk to everybody in different, whether it's our Saturday or, or our Sunday morning service, whether it's the folks meeting at home. And I'm just telling you, God is up to things. God is doing things, and we just need to keep praying because God's up to something. And it's just so fun to see what he's doing sort of behind the scenes because sometimes we don't know how it all connects right now. Um, one thing that we're going to be doing here this month is a neighborhood outreach. So we want to encourage you, if you know of families in your neighborhood uh, that uh, maybe you could just use a little blessing, we want to bless those families. Uh, we have these boxes our outreach boxes, and there, there's some in the back, uh, on the right next to the Welcome Center, back there, and you can uh, grab a box or two if you have someone in mind in your neighborhood, a family. Uh, you can grab one box per kid. That's kind of the goal. We just want to bless families and kids in our neighborhoods during this season, uh, just with some fun treats and also some fun little things that just point to Jesus during this time during the fall. So if you would like to grab those boxes, make sure you can grab one per one per kid. So it's a family of three that lives next door, and, or three kids, bring three boxes. And we're just excited to see hundreds, hopefully, hundreds of boxes go out to families during this month with those fall-themed outreach boxes. So make sure and get those. If you're at home, uh, make sure you can talk to Jennifer at whidbegrace.org. You can send her an email, and Jennifer will get you hooked up with boxes, uh, either we'll deliver them or we'll make sure we'll have some for you to pick up here at Grace. So that's just going to be a fun way we can touch families and we can get into our neighborhoods. Because how many of you guys know that as we're thinking about sharing Jesus with people, there's folks right next door that need a touch. We talked about that last week, and I actually saw some cool things happen this week as we prayed last week that God would give us opportunities I actually had some opportunities to share this week. I hope you did too. Uh, Share the good news of who Jesus is with our neighbors. Sometimes it's just in the simplest way. And uh, sometimes it's just a very simple word. So I want to encourage you, grab those boxes. Think about your neighborhood. Think about folks that might be nearby. Or maybe they're not nearby and you want to deliver them a box. Uh, We just want our, our body here at Grace to be reaching out into their neighborhoods during this time. Before we go to uh, our, we're going to take a short break where you can get some water, uh, take a restroom break, whatever you need to do, and also take a moment to give. I just want to give it one quick announcement. Sunday night uh, at 6.30, we'll be having our annual meeting. This is where we talk about all the finances of the church. We're very wide open about where uh, giving goes, and we are so thankful for the generosity of folks at Grace. So come join us if you're a part of Grace or you're looking at becoming a part of Grace, please join us tomorrow night, 6.30, for our annual meeting here at the church building. If you're unable to attend, uh, we will be recording that uh, so you can catch up on that. and We'll let you know and we can send you a link to that because we'll be recording it as well. And at that meeting, we're just going to be discussing uh, what God has been doing and what we're seeing, what we're planning on happening in the next year and how your giving and your faithfulness relates to the mission of God here at Grace Community uh, because your giving has enabled Grace to walk through this time uh, 
really having a pretty huge impact. And so I get really excited about the future in light of what I've seen God doing. Uh, but let's pray, and we're going to take a short break. We'll pray for our giving, and uh, we'll take a short break. Then we'll come and gather back in just a few moments. Lord, we're so thankful for who you are. So thankful, God, that uh, you are the provider for each one of us. You're the provider uh, for your mission here at Grace Community. And, Lord, we thank you, God, as we give. We're sowing into your mission here in this city. And we believe you have great things ahead for this church. And we thank you, God, for everything you're doing. And we ask, God, you just continue to open our eyes to needs in our community and to give us a heart, Lord, to reach out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to take a short break at this time. Make sure and check out the announcements, which will be up on the screen. And uh, we'll gather back in just a few moments. Make sure and greet people as well during that time. gather in. Welcome back. Welcome back. So good to be gathered again. Um, we have been walking through our conspiracy theory series, and again, I think almost every single week, almost every single week, we could probably come up with a new conspiracy theory that, that hits the news. That's how this series has been. Uh, at the beginning of the series, I thought this is going to be relevant. But I'm telling you, it's like, just watch the news. There's some new conspiracy theory probably happening this week you could refer to. So it's actually been uh, very uh, relevant during this time. But really what we've been talking about is not just, oh, what's happening in the news, uh, what's happening in our world, but really that there's a spiritual conspiracy theory afoot. And that's what we see in Ephesians 6, and that will, that's what we've been studying. And really, it's a battle. It's a battle for hearts and minds. It's a battle for the way we think. It's a battle for the way we see the world. And it's a battle for the way we relate to God. And it's a battle that really primarily works in, in our mind and in our heart and in our attention. And we make choices every day that relate to this battle. Sometimes good choices, sometimes bad one of the choices we make every day is what we will put our trust in. You know, I, uh, a few years back, I went. I, brought, I was a youth pastor at the time, and I brought a group of youth to a, a ropes course. If you're not familiar with that, a ropes course is where you have all kinds of challenges and ropes suspended from trees, and, and you do all kinds of challenges that are supposed to build team and frustrate you and all those types of things. And if you're like me and you don't like heights, like how many folks here, you, you, you don't, it's not that I mind heights, it's just I don't want to fall, right? That's really the key. I'm afraid of falling. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we did a, a service with Living Word together at the, the drive-in. And like they were meeting, you know, they were preaching actually up on top of like a shipping container almost. And I'm getting up there on the ladder and I'm like crawling up there all shaky. And I realized, man, it's been a long time since I was up high. Well, this particular time during this ropes course, at the end of the day, they had this big uh, element called the giant swing. And the giant swing consisted of a platform high up in a tree, like 25 feet up in the tree, and then a rope that you would, they would kind of latch you to, and then they tell you, okay, swing off. And as you swung off the 25-foot the uh, 
platform, it actually swung you out over this hill. So it feels like you're just going into nothing. Some of you are getting that sick, sick feeling in your stomach, you know, right now. And so at this particular time, it was the end of the day. All the kids had gone, and I, you know, I was like, well, if they forget about me. That's just fine. Um, and and the the person that was facilitating, I said, hey, you too. And they pointed to me and another one of the leaders, and they said, get up here. You guys are going to go together. So they latched us together, and they latched us onto this rope, and we were not small small men. We were, you know, we were probably the largest guys there. And and I said, are you sure this rope's going to hold us? And they're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, well, no, no, I'm, I'm asking you, like, how much weight does this rope actually hold? I want the weight rating. And like, oh, and you're like, we could, we could attach a pickup truck to this thing and send it out over the canyon and nothing would happen. I said, okay, I don't think me and my buddy weigh as much as a pickup truck. I think we're probably going to be okay. But there came the point where we had to actually latch in and put all of our weight on that rope. It's one thing to do it in your mind, isn't it? Oh, yeah, this rope is not going to break. Oh, yeah, me and my buddy, we're going to be fine. We're going to swing out over this thing. We might pee our pants, but nothing worse than that is going to happen, right? And uh, it's funny, though, because the way they rigged it up was they hoisted us up off the platform, so we were kind of hanging there, and then we had to pull this little linchpin, and it shot us out over the canyon. Um, and I remember being ready to pull that thing, and you, you have this moment of, like, do I really trust this? In my head, I trust it. But now I'm about to trust it with my whole life and my whole body. And, of course, as soon as we popped that thing off and swung over, it was the best thing ever, and we wanted to do it again. But you still had that moment of decision, the moment of trust. You know, when we talk about faith, and when the Bible talks about faith, there is actually a, a misstatement of that definition in our culture, and sometimes even in the church, where we look at faith as some sort of anti-reason, um, against all uh, things I should trust, I'm going to have faith, or against all facts, I'm going to have faith, and we like fix faith against facts. And that's actually uh, quite a mistake, and really, biblically, that's not what faith means at all. Faith defined biblically is trusting in something trustworthy. Trusting in something trustworthy. So when the Bible talks about having faith in Jesus, it's talking about trusting someone who is trustworthy. Trusting someone who will not fail us. Trusting someone who has a history of coming through. Trusting someone who death itself couldn't hold down. So when we talk about faith, we're talking about active trust. Just like I stepped out and actively had to trust that rope. I couldn't just believe the rope would hold me. I actually had to put myself in the position where the rope actually held all my weight. We're continuing our series on the armor of God, and as it relates to conspiracy theory, what do we put our trust in? You know, it's funny because I've known several conspiracy theorists in our life, and we were joking about it during this series. That almost everybody has some conspiracy theory that they believe in. We're like, I don't know if that's really what's happening there. There's something besides behind the scenes happening. And it really comes down to what do we trust? In some cases, we trust different news sources that are supposed to be giving us the real information. In other cases, we don't trust anything. We're completely paranoid and we'll trust ourselves. I've had friends that have built bunkers because they don't trust anything. You know, I don't blame them, actually, at all. But we have someone we can trust through all of the different things we see happening in the world, whether there's things happening behind the scenes that are nefarious or not, whether the enemy comes and tries to take you out, we have one we can trust who will come through and will help us stand firm. And that's what we're talking about in Ephesians 6. Will help us stand firm against the forces of darkness. We are in a battle. And the battle is something God wants to walk with us in if we'll allow him, and that's what this series has been about. So let's go and pray, and we're going to get into the Word. We're going to be in Ephesians 6, 
If you remember, Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus who was in a spiritual battle. And he was talking to them about how, yes, what you're experiencing is a spiritual battle. And you can put on armor, spiritual armor, that will help you stand firm. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you. You want to speak to each one of us. Thank you, Lord, that you know each one of us. You know what we're going through. You know how hard it is to trust you through everything. It's easier to trust what we can see. But, Lord, you have something great for each one of us. And if we will trust you, you'll lead us into that. In Jesus' name. So let's go ahead. Chapter 6 of Ephesians, verse 13, it says, Therefore, take up the full armor of God so you'll be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, and this is what we're focusing on today, take up the shield of faith, or taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and their mind would have immediately, in all likelihood, gone to the Roman, uh, the Roman armor. They were part of the Roman Empire at that time. They would see the Roman legion walking around. And this is what the Roman shield, this is actually, I think, an archaeological example of one of the Roman shields uh, that would have been in use. It was about four foot by two foot, rounded on the sides. And it was very, very effective for warding off all kinds of things that the enemy would try to bring. In fact, the Roman army was trained in such a way that if they used their shields correctly, they were almost invulnerable. And I've said this before, Rome, the Roman Empire, did not fall because the Roman legion was weak. The Roman Empire fell from within. And as we look to stand firm against the enemy, we look to stand firm in this world where there's all kinds of things that can take us down, it's always a battle for the heart and minds. And in this case, we're given this piece of armor, the shield of faith. So really what we're talking about today is this. Faith isn't a passive belief in something but rather an active trust that we walk in as we face the challenges of this world. Just like that rope, it's not passive, it's active, and it's something we walk out. It's something we live. It's not something I just believe. It's something I live and I walk out and I carry with me. So I want to talk today about three ways that the shield of faith works in our life. In fact, this is interesting because the shield here is the first piece of armor we're told what it does. The other ones, we're not told what they do. We're told what they are, but we're not told what they do. This is the first thing that says, here's what faith does. Here's what the shield of faith is effective in doing. So let's go ahead and walk through this scripture because faith is meant to be effective in our lives. It's meant to do something. It's, it was never meant to be defined as something I just believe in my head, a proposition I find true. Well, I believe this. It's meant to be something that is shown clearly as I walk out my life. So let's talk about this scripture and walk through it. It says, in addition to all, take up or taking up the shield of faith. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. You see... We're given this picture of the armor. So if you remember the scripture, it says they have the shoes of the gospel of peace. We talked about that last week. You can catch all of that online on our YouTube channel, Grace Community Church Oak Harbor. You just Google that or put that into YouTube. It'll pop up. You know, the shoes of the gospel, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, what those things represent in our life and our relationship with God. Then we are given this picture of the shield of faith coming up in addition to all of these. Or another translation, to cover all of those. 
Think about warfare for a second. Think about all the times maybe you've seen warfare depicted. Medieval warfare or Roman period warfare. They have this armor, but what happens when they rush into battle? The thing that leads is their shield. The shield is meant to be our first line of defense. Our first line of defense. You can bring up that, that next picture there. This is the Roman armor, probably a pretty decent depiction of, of what it might have looked like. And you can see there's some pretty solid, uh, there's a belt, there's a pretty solid breastplate of righteousness there, right? There's pretty solid shoes, footwear. But no matter what, there's always vulnerability, isn't there? There's always vulnerability. You never see someone going to battle who has a shield that's four foot by two foot, just toss that aside and walk into battle and say, take your best shot. You never see that. Because that would be ridiculous, because there's little points in the armor where something could get through. But the shield itself is impenetrable. It would have been made with wood, and then it would have been covered in uh, it would have been covered in leather, so it was actually not flammable. It would have been impenetrable. It's interesting because when it talks, when we talk about spiritual warfare, that we have an adversary, and we've talked about this over the last few weeks. Satan, our adversary, works by sowing lies into our life. He's the father of lies. And it says here, be sober of spirit, be on the alert. In Peter, it says this, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, and then it says, how? Firm in your faith. Not firm in your righteousness, the breastplate. Not firm in truth. Not firm in the gospel, like those other pieces of armor. It says, firm in your faith. That is the first defense. It's the first thing that should come up in our lives when we face any challenge is trusting in Him. Now, how does that work? How does that work? Well, think about this for a second. When's the last time you faced any kind of challenge? And what did you do? Did you immediately start thinking about natural solutions to this challenge? Did you immediately start saying, what can I do to solve this problem? If you're like me, man, you try and solve problems and you get frustrated and then you pull out the shield of faith and you say, okay, God, how do I walk through this? When really it's supposed to be the first thing. The first thing. Jesus, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? That's why God doesn't care about your education. He doesn't care about your skill set. He's not looking for people who are just skilled or highly intelligent. He's looking for people who have a heart that is turned towards Him because those are the people He can do incredible miracles through. If we'll just trust in Him, He will come in. Remember, again and again throughout God's Word, we understand the battle belongs to to the Lord. And what we do when the first thing we do is say, okay, Jesus, I'm in this situation. You're the Lord of my life. You died for me. You rose from the dead. You want to do things in my life. Okay, Lord, right now I'm going to trust you in this situation. What do you want me to do? Immediately that shield of faith comes up and the enemy cannot penetrate that anymore. It's when I walk in my own strength. It's when I say, look, I've got this wonderful armor on. I'm doing really well. And I can figure this out on my own. That is when we get into trouble. You know that old saying, God helps those who helps them help themselves? That's nowhere found in God's Word. It doesn't exist because the battle belongs to Him. He actually is our shield. The first step in winning battles in our life is to trust Him. You know, I've had tons of people come into my office wanting counseling. And I'll listen, and sometimes there's very practical things that we can walk through. Sometimes there's very 
you know, very fact-based problem solving. Well, here's what you need to do. But you know what? It's always a heart issue. And at the end of the day, no matter what, I always know if they're going to see that solution fully resolved, if they're going to see this conflict totally resolved in their life, it's going to be because they trusted Jesus in it and through it. It's the first thing we pick up. It covers everything else. And this is, this, is, this is why the gospel is so simple. This is why all I have to do is say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. Jesus, I believe you died for me and rose again. And he starts to work in my life. It's just faith. God, I trust you. I'm going to jump off of this platform, but I'm going to trust you. The next thing it, do, it does is this. The shield of faith, trusting in Jesus, covers our blind spots. It's a covering in our blind spots. Oh, man. Protection in our blind spots. How many of you guys got blind spots? Yeah, anybody who's lived a few years knows. The rest of you, you just don't know you got blind spots. We've all had that experience where you pull into a lane and someone was in your blind spot, right? And you, they, they crank on the horn or you see them at the last minute. Um, man, we all have them. See, Paul understood this. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3, he says, To me it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I'm not by this acquitted. The one who examines me is the Lord. He's saying, look, I, I have a clean conscience, but that doesn't mean anything. God is the one who examines me. See, the enemy's looking to blindside you. You remember that scripture we just looked at? The enemy is looking around for whom he might devour. Have you ever watched Nature Channel before, right? Any of National Geographic? And they, they, they will feature predators. What do the predators do? They always pick off the weak ones. They pick off the ones that aren't alert, paying attention. It's always a blind side. It's very difficult for these predators to catch their prey when the prey knows they're coming. We have blind spots. We have weaknesses. We have places where we don't know what we don't know. Man, not knowing something isn't a problem. Not knowing that you don't know it. That's the real problem here. But if I trust in him, Jesus, I don't know what I don't know. It's called humility. I don't know what I don't know, so I'm going to trust you that you are going to lead me. One of the most quoted verses in the Bible is out of Proverbs 3. It's, Acknowledge him in all your ways. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. Not get a bunch of wisdom, and then you'll make your path straight. You don't know if your paths are straight or not. He has the big picture. He can see it. When we trust in him, that's the way it goes. You know, it's interesting to see this play out in your life when you trust in God. When you trust in him and say, Lord, I trust in you. I don't know if I'm making the right decision, but I'm going to trust you and you can direct my steps. Interesting things happen. I bought a car, and it was a dumb decision. How many of you ever done that before? You bought something, it was a dumb decision. I didn't go into debt or anything like that for this car, praise the Lord, but it was a dumb decision. As soon as I get it, I take it to the uh, mechanic, and he says, well, this is a ticking time bomb. I'm like, thanks. That's really what you want to hear about your car. He's like, yeah, you know, I mean, it might run for a month. It might run for two years, but um, it's just there's there's a lot wrong with it, and you know, but nothing's wrong enough that we need to fix everything now. But stuff's just going to start going. Trust me. I'm like, okay, thanks for that. Anyways, so so probably a month from there, something starts going. I think, oh, here we go. Well, all right, plunk down whatever amount it was to fix that particular thing. While it's in the shop, here's what happens: the car is in the shop. And they're working on it. They open up the hood, and they start the car. And then the actual the fan, like the actual fan, disintegrates and breaks up into pieces. And it takes it, you know, it cuts through the belt. It shoots out, and they're just and they're in the shop. They're wondering what just happened. Oh, what's going on? And it wasn't that expensive of a fix. But here's what the mechanic said. He said, "Man, I'm so glad it happened in the shop." 
And I said, well, me too, because they actually took responsibility for it, which was a huge blessing. Uh, man, I, 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 I'll endorse, you know, you can ask me later what shop it was, I'll tell you. You can go there. Good folks, right? But they said, well, no, not just that it happened here, but if the hood wouldn't have been closed and that would have happened on the highway, it would have actually, you know, the pressure in the, in, in the engine would have actually just torn everything up, and you, you could have gotten an accident. It could have blown off the hood. It, was that, it had that level once everything kind of got wrapped around and, and, and blew up. And I just thought, man, thank you, Lord. I made a dumb decision, but the Lord has your back if you'll allow him. Now, I wasn't saying, oh, man, God, that was the greatest decision. I was saying, Lord, I think I did make a wrong decision here. Have mercy. Walk with me. Make my path straight. And he had my back. We're not meant to be paranoid. You can bring up that picture there. Uh, so the Roman legion, when they were going into battle, they could form a shield wall. In fact, they could form a whole 360 degree protection with these shields. Now, there's two lessons in that. The first is that God's got your back. When you're holding the shield, He has your back. It's not just you alone. He's the one who fights your battles. He has you. He can redeem things. Even your mistakes, He can redeem. Which I love that. If you're humble and will come to Him, He can redeem your mistakes. But I also love that, man, when you're around other believers who also have the shield, you all have each other's back. The greatest service you can get from another follower of Jesus is for them to point out a blind spot in your life. You might not think that because it's no fun hearing them say something, hearing them say, uh, hey, I'm seeing this. Do you see it? It's no fun not seeing it and thinking, oh, man, do I really have that issue? But it is the greatest service someone could do. And when you trust Him, when you trust God, you can receive that from others as well. Humility. Humility. Knowing that he has my back when I trust him. Even if I don't do it perfectly, because friends, you're not going to do it perfect. If you're in this walk with Jesus and you have a performance mentality, you're going to be severely disappointed in yourself. Because you will walk through this life and eventually you'll hit something that exceeds your ability to solve or get out of and you're going to need to trust that there's someone bigger than you who has your best interest in mind who loved you enough that he gave his very life for you and he forgave your sins and rose from the dead not just to forgive our sins but also work redemption in your life and if you let him in he can begin to work his redemption in your life no matter where you're at no matter what you've done I love when you look back at this scripture, it says, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which, and this is that specific application of this, with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You see, in that warfare during that time, they would be dipping their arrows in certain substances and then lighting them and then shooting them into the opposing army. And this is why the shields were made in such a way that they wouldn't burst into flames. It wasn't just a nice chunk of dry wood that when the flames hit it, it would just burst into the flames. No, it was covered in leather and often would also have water applied to that leather so that when those arrows hit, not only would they be Defended, they would actually be extinguished. It would stick into that leather and it would just go out because there was no fuel for that fire. And so the shield of faith is meant to be a fire extinguisher in your life. A fire extinguisher in your life. 2 Corinthians 10, Paul wrote this, and this is one of my favorite scriptures of all time. And I've applied it to my life again and again and again and again. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh. In other words, we're, we're in this world. 
You live in your flesh and your blood. We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses or strongholds. And then it describes what those strongholds are. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I believe that these fiery darts that come from the enemy many times are lies that get launched into our life and begin to start a fire in our life that is meant to destroy us. Let me give you some examples of this. We all have things that happen in our life. Sometimes really amazing things, sometimes really hard things. And those things make an impression on us, and we interpret those things one way or another. Some people you will see that something hard happens in their life, and it launches them into some level of greatness in an area that we say, wow. Sometimes you see something hard happen in someone's life, and it destroys their life, shatters why is that? Because it's not just a circumstance that happens. Something might have happened to you that was absolutely horrendous and painful and hurtful. But something else happens in our heart. We receive a message from what happens. And we can receive all kinds of different messages from things that happen in our lives. I'll give you one example. I was with another leader, and we were praying with a young lady. And she had felt rejection and had felt just a sense of brokenness. She had some major issues that came out of that feeling of rejection in her life. She actually walked into an eating disorder that got really bad. And so we were praying for her. And we asked a simple question. We asked, Lord, where did all this rejection begin? And this memory came to her, her mind where she remembered that growing up, she always remembered her dad telling her that she was an accident, she was a mistake, and he had told other people in his life that he never wanted a child. And as she described this memory, she started to cry. She just said, I, I'm a mistake. I'm I wasn't, I'm not wanted. And we began to say, well, you received a message. It wasn't that, she, I mean, she, her father loved her dearly. He'd say those things maybe unwisely or in jest, but he loved her dearly. This was a message that she didn't receive from her dad. It was accidental from her dad, but the enemy had come in and said, you're a mistake. You're not wanted. You don't belong here. And you could apply that to things maybe that have happened in your life. What message did you receive, and why do you feel the way that you feel? Because there's a fiery dart that gets in there, and it sets on fire your whole life. And so we walk around thinking things that are not true because we received a message somewhere. Somehow, that little fiery dart got through and pierced our hearts. So we're walking around thinking certain ways, and 2 Corinthians 10 says this, we have to cast down destroy speculations, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, Lord, this thing happened in my life. And in that moment, I received a fiery dart. You've got to recognize the dart. You know, there was one story of a Roman, uh, Roman centurion or a Roman uh, legionnaire where at the end of the battle, he looked at his shield, and he counted 220 arrows in the shield. All extinguished, right? Because that's what it was designed to do. So what we do is we have to say, Lord, I come to you. I see the circumstance, and I see the message I received from that, the lie that I received in my heart, that I was this or I was that, or where were you? But, Lord, I'm going to trust you. What do you say about me? I'm taking these thoughts I've had about 
myself, and I'm making them obedient to what you say about me, Jesus. I'm making them obedient to Christ. In other words, Jesus, if you say I'm loved, I am loved. If you say I'm not rejected, in fact, you died for me to accept me as a child, that's what's true. And we have to begin to allow God to come in and extinguish those fiery darts. But that takes a tremendous amount of trust. Just like it takes a tremendous amount of trust in a doctor to let them touch your wound, doesn't it? Man, if I come in wounded and I see a doctor fumbling around not knowing what they're doing, I'm saying I'm going to go find another doctor. In this case, you have the greatest physician ever. You have the healer of your soul who wants to come in and extinguish the fires that are burning in our lives that the enemy has brought in. We received a lie. We have believed it. And now we can stand and say no to that lie and we can say, Jesus, what do you want to do in me? Faith, trust in him, becomes the fire extinguisher. I'm going to have Jacob come up. And here's what I want to do. Let's stand together as we close. And I just want, just right where you're at, between you and God, you know, those, those of you that are graced at home, you know, maybe just right in your home or, or small group that you're gathering in, let's just take a moment all together and just allow the Lord to speak to some things. Maybe He wants to show you a blind spot in your life, a place anywhere you believe the lie about yourself. You know, I've heard many stories about, you know, my dad told me I was a loser and I felt like that ever since. Or I was rejected at this point. Or, or I was hurt in this way. And I, I, I just have carried this wound all the way through my life. And Jesus is saying, I believe right now, will you let me in? I'll extinguish the flaming arrow. I'll pull it out and I'll begin to heal you. But it's going to take trust. I think some of us here, we just need to take a moment and say, Jesus, I just need to trust you with this hurt I have. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. This isn't something you just power through, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and get over it, right? That's not how it works. Otherwise, you would have already gotten over it. This is about letting him in. Remember what we said about the armor of God. These aren't something, this isn't external things we carry. These are things that become a part of who we are. So if I really am going to trust God, I need to trust him and I need to let him in to where the fiery arrows have come into my life. And I need to say, Lord, would you extinguish those things? Would you show me the truth? And what is the thing that extinguishes the fire? It's truth. Jesus said this, the truth will set you free. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If anyone comes to me. I'll give him eternal life. See, God is the one who gives us his love. Jesus is the one. Will you let him in? If that's you, just right now, just say, yes, Lord, I let you in. I trust you with this wound. I trust you, Lord. Would you begin to pull out those arrows? Extinguish that fire. I trust you. And I let you in to what you want to do in my life. I'm just going to take a little moment of worship together. During that time, I believe that the Lord himself, the Holy Spirit, is going to come. And he's going to move in your heart if you'll let him. So I want to encourage you, if you have some wounds in your life, just put your hands out in front of you, just like an open place. Like, hey, Lord, come in. Examine my life. If there's a, way, a thing in me that you need to heal, I want you to heal that. Lord, those things that I'm missing, come, Lord. Just do something I could never do in myself. Lord, we worship you together right now. And we just ask in Jesus' name.
that as we close with worship, you'd speak to each of our hearts and you'd go far beyond what we could do in our own strength because we've trusted in you. We, have, we are lifting up the shield of faith and trusting you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together as we close. Lord, we thank You, Jesus, for what You're doing in our lives, Lord. Lord, that You're not just giving us this armor so that we can walk through life and be fine. Lord, You're giving us armor because You want us to draw near to You, and that's what it's going to mean. If we're going to win the battle, it's going to be because we're near to You. And Lord, as we're 
drawing near to you, would you heal us and help us put our trust in you more and more every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, before I release you, just we want to connect with you. If you're online or here in person and you want to get connected, one of the ways we have is our connection card. And all you have to do is actually text on your mobile device. You just have to connect, text the word connection to 474747, and it'll give you our online connection card, a link to that. And we, we want to connect with you, uh, get to know you, make sure you're in the loop about what's happening here at Grace as we move forward into the fall. And uh, don't forget about our fall outreach. Grab your boxes. You can come get them here at the church if you're at home. Or if you're here tonight, you can grab those as well. So God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your night. And uh, let's look, look forward to a great week.